I'm just briefly going to talk a little bit about your CPMC results, um, and then we'll open the floor to questions for uh, either Dr. Wang or myself. So we'll go through briefly genetic versus environmental contributions to colorectal cancer, the influence of other genetic variants on disease risk, the variants that we reported as part of your, your CPMC report, uh, implications for family members, very importantly, limitations of CPMC testing. Uh, Dr. Wang mentioned Lynch syndrome, which is a hereditary form of colorectal cancer, and that is not what your report, what your CPMC report focuses on. It's an important distinction. We'll talk more about that. And then resources for more information. So you, you hopefully have seen this type of graph before. We included in all of our reports. And it's really meant to illustrate um, what the genetic versus non-genetic contribution is to colorectal cancer. Now, this is the one included in your report, and this applies to most cases of colorectal cancer, your average case of colorectal cancer, where about 35% is caused by genetic factors, and about 65% is influenced by non-genetic factors, diet, lifestyle, things like that. It is important to note that there are rare hereditary colorectal cancer cases. So these are families where there is multiple individuals affected with colorectal cancer, or in some cases, um, as in the case of the disease Lynch syndrome that Dr. Wang referred to, you can have colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer and ovarian cancer traveling together in the same family. Those are very special cases. You usually see colorectal cancer occurring at an early age, before the age of 50. Um, and that's really the exception to the rule. So we don't expect most families where you see one case of colorectal cancer to fall into this category, to have a rare hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome. Those are the families where it's really striking, where you say, oh my goodness, the mother had colorectal cancer, the aunt, the grandmother, or the grandfather, and you really see multiple generations affected. So I just want to make sure that that distinction is clear, that if you say, well, I have one family member with colorectal cancer and nobody else in the family has had any type of cancer, that's not really a red flag for us, or, and it shouldn't be a red flag for you. Cancer occurs relatively often in our population. One affected individual in a family is certainly something to talk to your healthcare provider about, but should not be alarming. So again, um, we do, you might have noticed that the report was a little bit different this time, where you got a pop-up notice when you went to open your report. Um, and what we were trying to do is illustrate um, what the red flags would be. We don't want anybody who does fall into one of these rare cases, one of these rare families, to miss that or to misunderstand the result. We do want them to contact us so that we can refer them to the appropriate healthcare provider if they do have a strong family history something that um, warrants additional testing. So those red flags are a personal or family history of early onset colorectal cancer before the age of 50, and two or more family members with colorectal cancer or endometrial uterine cancer diagnosed at any age. So if you have a family history like this or you know of somebody, please direct them to contact us and we're happy to, to talk them through what their risk might be. Their CPMC report really wouldn't apply. This is, this is an exception not the rule. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about um, your average colorectal cancer and what falls into this genetic bucket over here. There are lots of different causes um, of colorectal cancer, lots of different genes that contribute to your risk of colorectal cancer. Just like all of the diseases included in the CPMC, colorectal cancer is a multifactorial disease. It's not caused by a single gene. It's really caused by a complex interplay of multiple genetic variants and multiple environmental factors working together to increase the risk of colorectal cancer. So not one factor is causing colorectal cancer in the majority of individuals that are affected. When we talk about your genetic risk, we give you uh, genetic information on one single variant, so that's one typo, basically, in your genome that contributes to your risk of colorectal cancer, but that's really not the only thing in this genetic bucket. It's not the only contribution. So we just want to make sure that it's clear we're giving you a window into your risk, but this is not a diagnostic test. So the variant that we've looked at is this one here, um, indicated by the red ball. 
Um, these are not size specific, but really just meant to show you that there's lots of things filling up this bucket. Um, this particular variant does increase the risk for colorectal cancer. Some of the reports we give you show you a protective change in the genome, a protective variant. This one is a risk variant. So the presence of this variant in your results would suggest that you have an increased risk for colorectal cancer. And in the Caucasian population, we would expect about 23 in 100 people, 23% of the population, to have two copies of this risk variant. So two copies of the variant that's increasing the risk. About half of the population will have one copy of this risk variant, and 27% of the population will have two copies of the non-risk variant, so what we expect to be the normal sequence. If you were to Google this variant, this is the reference number for it. This is what you would want to look up if you did any of your own research. So this is located in a region between two genes on chromosome 8. Um, that's basically the genetic address of where you can find this. It may affect copy number changes in gene expression in colorectal cancers, and it's also been associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about your results. This should hopefully look familiar to most people. But on every report, we include a risk summary that presents you with all of the risks that um, we're giving back to you for different risk factors. The green one is always genetic. The purplish, pinkish one is always family history. And then we show you a variety of non-genetic risk factors and how those contribute to your risk. And that, those risk estimates are based on um, the survey questionnaires you filled out when you entered the study about your family history and your lifestyle habits. In this particular case, well, we can dive deeper into each of them. And you can always uh, get to more information by clicking on the tabs across the top or from this page and clicking any individual cylinder that you want to learn more about. But we have provided some interpretation on the bottom of the, the risk summary page. In terms of the genetic variant, um, this cylinder shows you the range of risk. The, the, um, a person who does not have any copies of this risk, risk factor is at the baseline of one. Someone who has just one copy of the risk variant, and if you remember, you, get, you have two copies of your genome. You've got one from mom and one from dad. So at every place we look at in your genetic material, we're going to give you two results, because you should either have two copies of what's normally expected, you should have two copies of the change, or one and one. You, got, you had to get something from mom, and you had to get something from dad. So there's always two results to put together. In this particular case, again, someone who has no copies of the risk variant um, is going to be at a baseline of one. This individual from this sample report has one copy of the risk variant. And they're about 40% more likely to develop colorectal cancer than somebody who doesn't have any copies of this risk variant. Keep in mind that that's not a 40% risk, right? So doesn't mean that they, are, they have a 40% risk of colorectal cancer. They have about 40% more risk than someone without this variant, OK? So if in the average population, the risk of developing colorectal cancer is 5%. This person is maybe around 7% risk. Okay, so it's a slight increase. It's not a 40% increase. For someone who carries two copies of the risk factor, their their green disc would be up here, and their risk is about is 1.6 times or 60% greater than someone who doesn't have any copies of the risk variant. And this information is included in the interpretation over here on this side of the page. We provide similar information for family history. Family history in, in colorectal cancer and in many cancers is very important. So based on um, the family history that you provided us, someone who has um, one or more first-degree relatives with colorectal cancer actually is at four times the risk to develop colon cancer than somebody who has no family history of the disease. This is an important thing to consider. It's an important factor to share with your healthcare provider. Again, the risk is different if it's early onset colorectal cancer versus most colorectal cancers, as Dr. Meng 
Esther Wang mentioned, occur after the age of 50. So um, you want to take that into account. But in general, we can say that someone who has a family history of colorectal cancer is four times more likely to develop colorectal cancer themselves than someone without a family history. Some of the other risk factors um, that are included in your report, smoking. Smoking increases your risk for colorectal cancer as well as many other diseases. Alcohol intake. Um, this is a significant alcohol intake. This is not your glass of wine with dinner every once in a while or out with friends every once in a while. Um, it actually is drinking four drinks or more five days a week or more. So it, it's a significant alcohol intake that's driving up your risk. Um, and it's about equivalent to having one copy of the genetic variant that we've presented here. Uh, in addition, having a personal history of diabetes, either type 1 or type 2 diabetes, increases your risk. So if, you're a, if you are a diabetic, be aware that that increases your risk of colorectal cancer. If you're thinking about skipping your colonoscopy this year and you have diabetes, maybe this information will motivate you to, to pursue that. Um, inflammatory bowel disease as well, things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis increase your risk of col colorectal cancer almost three times as much as somebody who does not have inflammatory bowel disease. Dr. Wang had mentioned that obesity and inactivity increase your risk for colorectal cancer. It's hard for us to measure inactivity, but we can tell you based on how much physical activity you reported to us how active you are. And for those who are physically active, it actually reduces your risk. So any cylinder you see that goes under this 1.0 is a sign that your, your risk is lower than somebody else's. So somebody who exercises is actually about 29% less likely to develop colorectal cancer than somebody who's completely inactive. Body mass index is a risk factor um, where we found evidence in men, but not in women. So you might have noticed um, for the women in the room, or if you were looking at your report compared to your spouse, um, that you did not receive information on body mass index, but your partner did. Your, um, we do provide this information for men, but not for women, because we do want to show you what's relevant to you. And what we found is that body mass index is not um, statistically significant in women, but it is in men as a risk factor. So in males who have an increased body mass index who fall into the obese, I'm sorry, the overweight or the obese category do have an increased risk of colorectal cancer. And finally, colorectal cancer screening, um, specifically colonoscopy, is extremely important. Most of the data out there is around colorectal cancer screening in individuals age 50 to 70. So did you pursue your screening when you were supposed to in that age group? If you did, that is associated with a decreased risk of colorectal cancer. Actually, individuals who had their screening when they were supposed to between the ages of 50 and 70 had a 63% lower risk of colorectal cancer than individuals who ignored or did not pursue their screening. This information was only provided to individuals in that age group. So somebody who was 30 would have gotten an empty cylinder here. Um, we don't want to imply that every 30-year-old should go out and have a col col um, sorry, go out and have a colonoscopy to try and lower their risk, because this information is age specific. So one of the questions that um, myself and our other genetic counselor get most often is really how does this information impact my children? Um, a lot of people, when they first enrolled in the study, were enrolling in part so that they could understand what their personal risk was, but also so that they could get a little bit more information for their family members. And so we try to um, paint a little picture for you of how genetic information is passed so that you can think about this in the context of your own personal results. What's difficult about projecting your children's results is that it depends both on your information as well as your partner's, right? So we, do, we have to do a little bit of guessing if we don't know both your results and the, the other parents. 
if we assume that two people are um, both have one copy of the risk variance, then the chance that each of their children would inherit the risk variance are these. 25% um, of their kids, so about one in four, would get two copies of the non-risk variance. Half of their children would get one and one, one copy of the risk variant, one copy of the non-risk variant. And then we would expect one in four kids, 25%, to get two copies of the risk variant. These numbers reset with every pregnancy. So there's a 25% chance that each child got this. Doesn't matter if they were the first in line or the last in line. It's like rolling dice. They, the, the odds of getting a certain result reset each time. If you and your partner are both in the study and you know what your results are and you happen to fall into this category where one of you has two copies of the risk variant, I'm sorry, one of you has uh, two copies of the non-risk variant and one of you has two copies of the risk variant, then we can say that each of your children regardless of birth order or anything else, will each inherit one copy of the risk variant and one copy of the non-risk variant. If your family looks like this, um, you and your partner are both in the study, and we know that one of you has two copies of the non-risk variant, and the other one has one copy of the non-risk and one copy of the risk variant, we can tell you that um, about half of your children will have inherited two copies of the non-risk variant and about half of your children will inherit one copy of the risk variant and one copy of the non-risk variant. It's important to remember, though, that the genetic information that we're telling you about is one small fraction of your risk. You have to really look at the bigger picture, the lifestyle variables, um, family history, things like this are, in, are very important components to take into consideration when thinking about your overall risk for colorectal cancer. So a few of the result limitations, the variant, there are variants in many genes that have been associated with colorectal cancer. We're giving you one piece of information out of many that contribute to your risk. There's no single genetic variant that can completely predict your risk. Even with the hereditary cancer sy syndromes that we've mentioned, those put you at an extremely high risk if you were to have that separate testing, different genes, different variants that are looked at in those hereditary cancer syndromes not covered by the testing that Coriel does. Those, even looking at those genes, that does not confer 100% risk. So there's no genetic variant for colorectal cancer that can say with 100% certainty you will develop colorectal cancer. And certainly the variant that we looked at does not give you that type of information. Um, results of CP and I, I've already said this, that results can't alone can't diagnose you. Um, risk factors such as family history or lifestyle may actually have a greater impact on your risk than any individual genetic variant. And that was true, remember I said that with a family history of colorectal cancer, your risk is actually four times that of somebody with no family history. That's a strong risk factor and something to, to take into consideration. As we learn more about the genetic contribution to colon cancer, your genetic risk for colorectal cancer may change and we may release new results or updates to results in the future to reflect that new information. Um, you can always find more information or contact a genetic counselor through this tab on your, on your results. Um, there's a tab that says, what do I do now? This is where we post the educational sessions, but you can also email a question to a genetic counselor, schedule an appointment to talk to a genetic counselor, or watch the video or read um, some information about the condition. Again, if you think you're at risk for hereditary cancer syndrome based on your family history, please contact us. We're happy to walk through a risk assessment with you and make the appropriate referral so that you get the right testing. The testing included as part of the CPMC does not test for hereditary cancer syndrome. This is just a brief list of some of the hereditary cancer syndromes that are out there. There are, um, there's one called FAP. This is associated with a very early onset colorectal cancer, which um, patients with this syndrome have hundreds of polyps in their colon, right? One or two polyps, not a red flag for the syndrome. This is something where um, a doctor would find hundreds of polyps. Um, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, uh, HNPCC is also known as Lynch syndrome. There are a lot of different genes associated with that. Again, that's when we see colorectal cancer before the age of 50. 
multiple generations affected, and we also see endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, and a few others with that. And then there's a few more that are, that are relatively rare, um, even compared to these, which are relatively rare. <laughs> um, for more information, if you're looking for information on colorectal cancer, we do have written edu educational information um, under our genetic education tab on our homepage. Um, we are continuing to release new results over time. Um, we will be releasing a new result for breast cancer in the next few days, and so we would um, certainly love to see you at a future educational session around that condition, um, and you're also welcome to call us with any questions. Finally, just a plug um, for our outcome surveys. This is really how we figure out whether or not personalized information like this is useful. We ask you to fill out surveys that you take about five minutes that ask you questions about what you did with the information. Did you share it with your healthcare provider? Did he or she make any recommendations? Did you actually follow through on those? Uh, did you decide to make any changes on your own? Did this information cause any anxiety? Did you seek out more information in any way? It's really valuable information for us to collect from you. And we would ask that you would take a little bit of time to fill these out. So I want to thank you for your participation. And we are happy to answer any questions from either the audience here with us today or 